the lows have been so low and the highs have been so high and the growth has been so substantial for me and I know for others as well. I still struggle with the feeling of not being good enough. 2020 was very challenging. Going into the pandemic, before the pandemic, multi-million dollar company, 24 full-time staff, I had made the decision that I was going to walk away from it. I was finally so unhappy with it that, that it was the hardest decision ever to just say, I'm going to stop doing this. The headmaster's office, you know, that feeling of like, oh, you were talking about me? Oh, what, what's <laughs> up? Inspiration Nation. Hello, Lee Kemp here for another week on the podcast, even as always with my very good friends, Ryan Boniface and Jose Neuer. How are we doing, guys? Yeah, not bad. Thank you, Lee. Very good. That's good, Joe. After Joe took the longest time known to man to join a Zoom room after clicking the link at the same time of us. I don't even know how he does it. Anyway, I'm going to shorten my preamble. Just say thank you, everyone, out for listening, supporting us. Follow us over on Twitter at listen to I N, listen T O I N. And for Joe's subject this week, he's roped in a guest, very special <laughs> guest for us, joining for the second time on the podcast, Mr. Mark Drager. How are you, Mark? I am amazing. It's my sophomore attempt to be here. So hopefully <laughs> I don't screw it up. <laughs> That's what I like. Good ambition. Ow. Thank you for joining us. And it was, in fact, for those who like to trawl the archives, and we know that you're out there, all the way back, I've lost it now, I think it was July 2020, so we're just coming up on two years when Mark joined us for the first time, all the way back on episode 72 for an interview with Joe. Wow. I can't believe that was nearly two years ago now. That's crazy. Wow. So anyone who wants to know about Mark, what he does, what stuff was like then, Go into the archives, listen then. We won't just repeat the whole interview again. We we'll, we're we'll looking at what's happened since that time Mark was with us. Um, I'm sure we've all got a few questions, so chip in with them when they are. Um, but yeah, say Mark, thank you very much for joining us. Um, how's your life been in the last two years? <laughs> what a, a concise <laughs> answer on that as well. <laughs> what a loaded question. How's your life been? <laughs> Uh, through, you know, the pandemic and all of these, I live in Canada, so multiple lockdowns. And it's funny, uh, a few months ago, we had uh, Easter and it was the first time I got together with my extended family. So I'm seeing my cousins and their spouses and all of the great grandkids are together. And uh, my cousin's wife, who we used to be very close with, turns to me and says, so how you doing? And I'm like... <laughs> I don't know. I'd like, I have no frame of reference <laughs> to explain it because I think like so many of us, the last few years has both been a blur and we wake up and we go, Oh my God, it's 2022 already. What happened to 21 and what happened to 20? And, and also like, which part of the last two years do you want to go with? Because the lows have been so low and the highs have been so high and the growth has been so substantial for me. And I know for others as well, that it's, it's almost as if, when we're circling around with people we haven't seen in a few years, it's almost like we're brand new people. I'm, I'm completely different than I, I mean, completely different than that previous interview. And, and so it's kind of like I'm re-meeting people for the first time. So I say all that to say, I'm great. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know which part you want to dig into over the so, last two years. And the, you know, I, I listened again to the interview um, earlier this week. It's probably the third or fourth time because I, I really like this one. I, plus, I like to bump up our listener numbers, so I try and listen as often as I can, really. Um, but there were some bits about the interview about you that really resonate with me. I remember, Joe, you were saying, God, you're so like Mark. There's so many things that are just like you. And I think I appreciated them even more on this listen, being able to reflect back to me a couple of years ago. So... I kind of got swept up in listening to that, wanting to ask you about how you've grown on certain aspects. And I completely even forgotten that just like the rest of us, you'd have gone through this whole bumpy COVID journey that will have sent you off in completely different directions with, you know, you as a person, where your development are, where you are in terms of, you know, business aims, personal aims, all that sort of, all that sort of good stuff. So the thing that really stuck out in the first interview we did, and it, it was quite early in the interview, but then it kind of became the theme for the rest of it, is you talked about how effectively, for you personally, nothing you ever do is good enough. And that's the bit that, that stuck with me a bit. Ryan will attest to, and quite often points out to me that I'm my own harshest critic. So if I say something's good, it must be really, really good. 
Um, so I understand where you're coming from with that, but you discussed this kind of, you know, you had lots you wanted to do, but then you'd worry about, would I be too lazy? Um, have I got the right skills to do it? Am I disciplined to do it enough to do it? Am I lucky enough to do it? And this whole internal dialogue, you were kind of wrestling with in your head about what makes you happy, what your ambitions are, where you want to go. Joe pushed you really, really heavily on that happy question all the time. And I, I feel this pain from him quite often as well in how he goes. But so from that, that person there who was wrestling with these, I don't know, unfulfilled ambitions, but at the same time being very successful and not knowing what it was you wanted. I suppose, where where are you now, kind of, in your own personal view of success? Oh, this is going to be so much fun, because I, I get the chance to now do a bit of a, a temperature check between where I was, say, two years ago and where I am now. Um, and upon reflection, looking back, I still struggle with the feeling of not being good enough but but less so than I used to. And so when I look back at that time, if we go back to 2020 and even 2019, 2018, 2017, and we go back through my story, we won't rehash the whole thing, but I, I've come to realize that I was living out of alignment. And a lot of the moments of excitement followed by depression, the cycling between optimism and hopelessness, the feeling like I, I have huge dreams and big plans, but what if they never happen? What if I can't do it? You know, that all of that cycling I, I've come to realize is because I was living in a very stressful, fight or flight, unhappy place. I wasn't happy with my business. I wasn't optimistic and hopeful about the future and what could be. I wasn't excited about things. And so when you're going to work each day, and, and maybe our listeners feel this way, when you're going to work each day and it's like extremely routine, it's boring, or maybe you hate it. When you come home and it's the same old, same old, but so much of your, of your finances or the lifestyle you've created or the um, identity that you've wrapped up into what you do, when it's all tied there, you feel like if you just take a step back, if you just slow down, if you just stop, you're going to lose it all because you're just running yourself ragged to try and keep everything up, keep the pretenses up, keep the, 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 the work up, keep everything up. But you're just so unhappy. And so uh, over the last two years, the biggest shift that's happened, challenge after challenge, facing each of these really hard things, and, and we can get into them if you want to, but what I've realized is today, I'm far more in alignment in terms of what I want my company to do, what I spend my days doing, and what excites me. Now, I have a whole new batch of challenges and fears in front of me. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, I've, I don't quite struggle as much with the like, uh, with, with that feeling of not being good enough because over the last year, especially I've not only been able to identify the areas that I'm pretty freaking amazing at, but I started to value them. And that's a huge shift for me. Love that. Yeah. That's really interesting. It's, thank you for being so kind of open on that as well with how you feel of it so with like you said and I you've um certain things you keep doing you're on that hamster wheel it's become who you are it's how you identify it funds your lifestyle and you're in that that unhappy place but not knowing it like you said so for you what's what is it that you let go of holding on to that's kind of let you take that next step forward in I don't know the, the business or how it's run or what what you do with it yeah so so 2020 was very challenging. Going into the pandemic, before the pandemic, multi-million dollar company, 24 full-time staff. We were, you know, we were, we were rocking. <laughs> at, at this point, uh, I think, I, I got to add it up, I think there's five people, four or five people on the team. Uh, we're a fraction of the revenue we were then. And so ultimately what, what's happened and part of what I've spent the last year doing is embracing and facing truth and reality. And this is something that I, I struggle to articulate, but it's like we so often would rather live with the devil we know than, than risk something better 
but we have to take that risk. So for example, let's say that you're in a, an abusive relationship. Why is it that as an outsider, we look at people in abusive relationships and just say, just, just get out, like just free yourself. You're so much, but there's other fish in the sea. You, you're be so much better. You're worth so much more. And yet that person keeps going back to that abusive relationship. It's because they're more comfortable with the devil they know than that terrible uncertainty. And so what I've had to do with my business is not only embrace that uncertainty, but we have kind of burned the whole thing to the ground. We, we, the, like the whole company, I, I, I had to hit a point where I was willing to release it and let it go. And, and that means losing and turning over the clients, losing and turning over the team, letting go of my identity being wrapped up as the you know founder of a creative agency and this multi-million dollar stuff and we work with the nba and we fly on planes and all that stuff like just let it all go uh and in doing so like letting go of that letting go of who i'm supposed to be in the relationships i am so so a lot of times again we we, we show up for other people the way they want us to but not ourselves being willing to risk those relationships, saying the hard truths that I have to say, being willing to risk offending people or them judging me. And so really a lot of this is just letting go of all of that stuff. And COVID did help provide a little coverage because I didn't have to bump into people and see people and all of that stuff. And it gave kind of an excuse because people were all going a little wacky and you can do some kind of weird, strange things and people would write it off as COVID. But, but ultimately, being able to create a space in my life for the person that I want to become next meant I had to clear house and I had to kind of burn a bunch of things to the ground and be willing to just walk away from everything and like release everything and let go of everything. So that way I have room for kind of what's next. And that is an incredibly hard and scary and uncomfortable thing because you're not only losing all this stuff that you worked for and you are holding on to, but in that vacuum, in that empty space uh, that is possibility and excitement and almost anything, there is still no certainty there, right? There's still, I, I don't know if you're following what I'm saying, but, but I'm clearing house in my life for what could be next, but I don't know if what's next will come. And so that is a huge leap of faith. Yeah. Absolutely. yeah, I just want to add to that because you almost talk, we talk about Maslow in the podcast and, you know, the levels of, you know, food, drink and all that. And that level of certainty, safety, I think, is what you're talking about. The, the, the old version of you and now having to sort of, you, you know what you want, but having to let go of all that stuff is there's a lot of safety. And as Tony Robbins talks about, he burns the boats, right? And people talk about burns the boat. So I know you're great friends with Evan and he talks about he's not a burn the boat type of guy. He's more like, hang on, let me look at stuff. And but you almost like you almost went to that burn the boats type of moment because I remember you talking to me in that interview. So well, because I asked you what is gonna be? Is it gonna be Mark Drago? Is it gonna be Fanta? And you were all oh, I know you were 20 years actually, Fanta's gonna go and I'm just gonna go with my podcast. But then you spoke to someone, didn't you? You spoke to a guy on your podcast who said, Hey hey, keep Fanta, didn't he? And then you said you had to start yeah. changing things. The guy who ground his teeth, I can't remember the name, but the guy yeah, who ground Bradley. his teeth, right? English guy, right? Well, he's Australian, but he is in the UK. Oh. He does live in... Oh, right. I mean, I don't know if... I, okay. I, yeah, so an Australian guy, Nick Bradley, uh, he's the host yeah. of the podcast Scale Up with Nick Bradley, and he's a business scaling expert. But uh, I was lucky enough over COVID to connect with him through Clubhouse, and we became friends. And you're exactly right. I mean, by a, a year ago this time, I had made the decision that I was going to walk away from Fanta, that, that um, what I had built up in the way that it was operating, I, I realized that I had spent a bunch of years not being the leader I needed to be, not making the investments I needed to make, not excited about what it could be. And it was just kind of on the back burner. And I was finally so unhappy with it that that it was the hardest decision ever to just say, I'm going to stop doing this. Should I sell it? Should I shut it down? What should I do? I don't know. But I, I did use kind of most of the summer to try. I, I almost didn't even know. Like I just knew that I couldn't keep doing what I was doing, but I didn't know what was next. And then I was at an event uh, in Tampa, Florida, that uh, my friend Steven Scoggins, the, the host of, uh, of a great podcast, and then Nick Bradley, we were all there hanging out. 
Um, and I have to say that's, that's, that's exactly one of the type of things where it's like as an entrepreneur, as, as the owner of an agency, I could get on a flight and, and just go to the States and hang out with some people for a few days, right? Like, like I had built up a lifestyle <laughs> where uh, I've said this to my wife and I don't say this to brag, but we're not extravagant people. So by not being extravagant, we could do anything we wanted anytime we wanted without thinking about it. If we wanted to buy something, we bought something. If we wanted to go somewhere, we went somewhere. Like, like again, we're not, we're not crazy extravagant, but for the first time, it's, if, if I'm giving up my company and if I'm walking away from this stuff, maybe I can't do this kind of stuff in the future. Maybe I have to tighten up my belt. Maybe these luxuries that I've just grown used to, I have to sacrifice and give up. But I'm in Tampa and... And Steven Scoggins runs a hundred million dollar business, and Nick Bradley is an M and A expert who's been a part of 117 uh, exits worth 5.2 billion dollars in acquisitions. So, like, <laughs> and then there's me. There's, <laughs> there's, and then there's Mark, you know, the guy who ran a creative agency. Open like, a table. Come on. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. And and Steven pulls me aside and says, Mark, you know, last night I go to bed early. They were like, we were at the bar. Me and Nick are at the bar, and we were talking about you all night and two things happens. One, I feel so loved. I'm like, what? You were talking about me. And the second is like, I feel like I've just got called into the principal's office, <laughs> <laughs> the headmaster's office. You know, that feeling of like, oh, you were talking about me. Oh, what, what's <laughs> up? And, and Steven was like, you cannot let your company go. You can't, you, you know, you have 15 years of experience and of work and, this podcast, We Do Hard Things and turning it into a publication and doing all this stuff, it's just going to take so much longer than you think. And it's going to cost so much more money than you think. And you are a husband and you are a father and you have a responsibility to those who are counting on you to be able to not blow it. Like, let's say this takes you five years. I only had a year and a half of runway. Um, let's say it takes you five years. What are you going to do? So you just, you need to be more realistic. So that was one conversation. And then later that day, I'm speaking with Nick. And this is part of earlier I said that I've come to realize that I'm pretty awesome at some things and I'm now valuing them. I had a conversation with Nick about what we do in Phantom Media as, as a branding agency, as a creative agency, as a company. And we started talking about his brand and I got really excited because I, I love this stuff. I love brand building. I love building environments. And he's like, Mark, this is the first time I've seen you like really lean forward and get excited and speak with confidence and almost like preach about the way things should be. And I said, yeah, well, I have, like, I have tons of experience. Like I just, I have so much experience in this. It's just like second nature it comes easy to me. And he's like, well, why aren't you doing this? Well, that ties back to that, like that feeling of being not good enough or being a failure of trying stuff, of, of being stuck, of running a company a certain way and not enjoying it. And he's like, you don't have to run the company that way. Like, you can run the company any way you want. You can service any type of client you want. You can charge whatever you want. Like, as long as you have people who are willing to pay for it and come along with you as clients, you don't have to run the company the way you've run it just because you did it that way. And, and what you do has value. It's, it's enough. It's, it's, it's enough. And so he reminded me of a lesson I learned a long time ago, and maybe you guys have all realized this as well. It's that the things that we are often the best at come naturally to us to a certain degree, and we undervalue them. I'm, I'm really good at understanding like complex situations and doing target audience breakdowns and helping people understand in the moment what to say to help unlock and get people to move forward, which is messaging and branding and all that stuff. Like I'm, I'm really good at that. I know I'm really good at that. And so I kind of just downplay or undervalue that maybe not everyone is so good at that. If you're amazing at technology, you may not realize, Jose, Joe, you suck at it. <laughs> Thanks for that. I knew that was coming. I was going bang, 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 get, it, get it quick. Get it. Yeah. yeah true. But, but, and so, and so, <laughs> you know, getting someone to set up a Zoom call might come really easily to you. <laughs> but that's a service Jose might pay for because listeners, he's not good at that, it turns out. <laughs> so I've got, got the guys here, right? <laughs> So well, that was team, ultimately yeah. <laughs> why, I, yeah, why I decided, you know, I'm going to save the company. I'm going to 
turn it into what I want it to be. And then suddenly everything became so exciting, like scary, but exciting, full of possibilities. The future is optimistic. And having spent a year almost in down cycling where the future is uncertain and you're not working for something bigger and you're not excited, like I, I've never lived that way other than kind of 2021. And then suddenly having something that I could build and that I could work towards and that I could bring into the world and we could tweak and we can play and we can engineer and we can fix. And it's like, suddenly it's, and, and, and this comes down to like in 2021, when I was in a scarcity, we're shutting everything down. I'm not sure what's happening. My kids need new computers. I'm not buying them new computers because I don't know, like what, like what? And then suddenly it's like, oh, I'm saving the company. <laughs> I went and bought them new computers. And it's like, it's like, when the future in front of you is full of possibilities because you're working towards something, you can take bold action. When the future is uncertain because you don't have that goal or you don't have confidence in yourself, it erodes everything you do. And, and that has been the last two years now. I've been on both sides of that. Yeah. That's a great I think one. when you said about giving yourself a temperature check, I think the, the biggest difference there between listening to you nearly two years ago and now is you were really focused on talking about your awareness of what you're not good at and how it could have been you know dragging people down or causing issues and that you were kind of on that step of embracing that there were things you weren't good at and it's kind of like now you've gone through that and actually so much so to the other side that you're now embracing the things you're good at and focused on the the positive side of that coin is that there's there's really good things you can really, really dig into rather than there just being some negatives that you need to shy away from. Because we, we've all got that. We've all got the good and the bad. And like you said, you do take what you're good at for granted. And I don't know if you find it as well. Because you take it for granted, it can sometimes be frustrating when other people don't come as naturally to those things as you do. But like you said, not everyone does. I mean, we've seen a little bit of that today, possibly with our good friend Jose there and his Zoom setting up capabilities. <laughs> You're never going to that down, man. <laughs> yeah, I'm totally going down for this, yeah. But it just adds to the book, Joe, adds to the book. And there's something else you said that I just wanted to highlight um, in that discussion there, which I don't think gets said enough to people or acknowledged by people, which is that phrase, it's enough. And I think that's a really, really powerful phrase for people. You know, everyone's always looking at what's ahead of them, what they've got to do, what they've got to climb the mountain, what they didn't get done off of their to-do to list for that day, even though they've probably gone into the day with great intentions, they've put all the effort in they can for umpteen reasons. Things might not have gone how they wanted or they did go how they wanted. And it's just that phrase of, you know, you've tried, it's enough, you're doing good, keep going. And I, I think that's something that, that needs to get kind of expressed more and more. And I just, I really like that you use that phrase because it's, they use it in a, Ryan can help me with what the kids say today, a song, a track, a single, whatever it is, something that's on the radio. And part of the chorus is just that phrase of it's enough. And it really speaks to me every time I hear it, partly from that view that maybe it's just me that I don't say it to myself enough, but I don't think we, we do hear it enough out there from people. And it, it sounds like you're, certainly from where you are two years ago, you're getting to a really good place with that, that it's not just, ah, I should be doing all of this. It's now, now I'm doing good and I'm doing enough. And it's a constant battle. Just two or th two weeks ago, I guess, I was out for a walk one evening. Uh, I go for a walk every day with my wife at four, unless she's working. She happened to be working, so I was out alone with my dog. And I was circling all the things that I'm not. Again, like just, I should be, and why aren't I? And it's, And then... I stopped myself for a second, I actually stopped walking even. And I thought, okay, Mark, what would you give yourself a pat on the back for? And especially being at home now, uh, because, because we shut our offices down, I now work from home. I'm a really good dad now. I didn't used to be. I still have a lot of work to do with my patients and I get super frustrated and I'm hard on my kids, but I'm a really good dad. And I'm a great husband and I'm a hard worker, and I'm a quick learner, and uh, I am optimistic and a, a visionary kind of thinker. I can see what other people can't. Like, I started on this walk going through and just saying, Mark, like, you're a good father, and you're a great husband. 
Isn't that worth something? And it shifted, and this is just two weeks ago, right? It shifted again from the like constant focus which, that I have or had or what have you, that my, my quote unquote natural state of fixed mindset or scarcity or, um, or pessimism, always looking at the things I'm not, ignoring the things I am. And so I've started to work really hard to focus on those. Yesterday morning when I woke up, I was not excited about the day or the week. I was feeling terrible. I was feeling horrible, not excited about the day or the week. And I looked at my calendar and I'm like, oh, I got to do these things. And I stopped for a moment and thought, this is what I wanted. A year ago or two years ago, I was, I was dealing with constant fires and um, and, and every time the phone would ping or every time an email would come in, it's just more headaches and I hated it. And it's like, now I'm looking at my schedule and yesterday it was a little boring. It was a little dull, <laughs> right? There wasn't that hit of adrenaline that we often get as entrepreneurs. And I, and I had to say, this is what you wanted. Like, this is a healthier calendar and it's a little slower. And yeah, you're not getting as much done. And there's not this constant like excitement that I was addicted to, this this constant rush. But but this is what you've been working. This is why you did all that hard stuff and made those hard decisions and did all that stuff so you can have days like this. So just give yourself a pass. That's kind of where I am today because I'm not sure if I should give myself a pass, if I should be harder on myself or any of those things. But I have worked super hard, and I appreciate you even noticing that. I've worked super hard recently to pat myself on the back for the things I am. Yeah, really I love that. Good, really that's good back, back, back to that thing, that voice in your head, isn't it? So before it probably was, you know, we had that voice and we talk about it in the podcast, we've had an episode where we talk about voice in it and how that can bring you down or lift you up and how you get feeding yourself with the stuff that does fill you up, like the people around you, all the stuff that you hear in the personal development space, which actually does really, really work. And you seem to be like a living testament of that which is fantastic for me. I think I, I love that. And the fact that you're know, telling yourself, you're a great father, you worked hard, you're a hard worker. You know, Those are the important things, the things that, that we need to tell ourselves, but we need to put in the work, connect with those people. So I love that. Because um, you said that it's even, you know, you want to slow down. I don't, for me, and I know because when we went right back and you were like struggling and you went to Anthony Robbins, we talked about in the last episode and stuff like that. You said there was that depression. Is and for me, I'm, I'm talking about more personal thing now because you've been through. I know you you launched the We Do Hard Thing podcast. We've do, done, you know, launched that now. It's really great. Um, where are you now with the depression? Is it still there? Do you, do you have to keep an eye on it? You know, I know you've done a lot of you know the, the, the chunk to hunt challenge. You can talk about things about that. Did that help? Um, you know, what has worked? for you to get through that that darkness i suppose because that's how i saw it but i don't know how that's how you see it what are your thoughts on that um i've i've embraced or gotten comfortable with the fact that i that i cycle up and cycle down now so when i say that i was having a really tough day yesterday i i did not feel good my head wasn't in it um and I just gave myself a pass. I was like, you know what? I, I still showed up for my first workout in the morning. I do tour regrets on Monday. I still showed up for my last workout. I still did all the stuff I was supposed to do. But I, but I kind of just said, today's not going to be a good day. You know? And I tried to turn it around. I tried to say, well, what could I do? And what's the difference? It's all in my head. It's all I'm feeling. And, but, but I just kind of said, I just wrote off the day. And so I do still get down quite a bit. I, I'm better at noticing how I cycle up. You know, I'll spend maybe a week or two slowing down and not feeling great about things or feeling uncertain about things. And then a few things will line up and I get really excited. Um, I haven't hit the place yet. And, and I, th I think I probably am going to work on it over the next six to nine months um, where I can actually engineer things to keep me motivated. So for example, I know from my disc profile and some profiles that I've done that I that my main two motivating factors is recognition, which I've always known. But but when you do these disc profiles, they come back with like seven or eight different things that motivate you. But if you read between the lines, they boil down to two things. One, I love recognition. And I used to think that that was shallow. 
and you know, like I'm only going to do this so people recognize how awesome I am. Like how shallow is that? And how silly is that? And, and so that's one. And then the other is this constant change. Like I just, I can't do things the same way more than like two or three times without becoming extremely bored with it. Um, so, so, and, and I didn't even realize how much it affected me, but you know, some days I'm working here in my office and then I'm working on this computer, then I'm up in the kitchen, then I'm outside the next day and I'm just like all over the place with my workouts. I like working at 9.30, suddenly I like working at 5.30, and then it's like, ugh, 5.30 is terrible. What about in the evening? And oh, I love evening runs. And it's just like, I need constant change, and I need recognition. I have not, over the last, in all of April, we were in build mode for Fanta, where I was not doing anything to get recognition. I wasn't going anywhere. I wasn't putting stuff on social. Uh, you know, it was just like this grind of like building processes and building team and doing these things. And because it was all of that grind, it also wasn't a lot of change, exciting change, big, bold change. So over the next six to nine months, I'm, I'm almost, first of all, I've embraced, okay, cool. This is the stuff that fires me up and lights me up. I'm not going to judge it. I like a lot of change. I better be doing things in my business or in my life that feed that change. I like recognition. Okay, cool. So sue me, guys. <laughs> so, so sue me that my ego is tied to the fact that, that you know, I'm doing Spartan this weekend. I haven't been talking about it on social, but I was saying to my team, hey team, you know, if, if you wanted me to take this more seriously, if you wanted me to get super aggressive with this, I should be about 10 pounds lighter for it. If, if, if I was actually dieting like hardcore, if we had tied recognition to it and we had turned it into a vlog series and I knew that I was doing it and putting it out there, I would take it more seriously and I would work a lot harder at it. So over the next six to nine months, I really want to be able to start to play with this stuff. But I also recognize that I go through these like two, three weeks of like slowdown and then these like three or four weeks of like aggressive, hardcore focus and then slow down and then focus. And again, I used to, I, I think the theme for this episode is going to be over the last year, I've just embraced that things are the way they are. And, you know, Winston Churchill used to go through these cycles. You could look at his life uh, you could like him, you could hate him, whatever you want, but you could look at his life as an author, let's say, and all the stuff that he wrote and all the work that he did. And you could say, wow, look at the collection of work. But you're looking at the macro. You're looking at the 10 or 15 years of work. You're not looking at the fact that maybe three weeks went by when he couldn't get a word out. I don't know. And then suddenly he knocked out, you know, this amazing book or whatever. I did, I, I deep dived and listened to this whole lecture on, on the life of Beethoven. And Beethoven, you know, the, 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 the composer is known for just producing the most revolutionary work ever. But, but he was so sick and he was so disheveled and he was so poor and he didn't have any great relationships that there would be these two or three year periods where he'd produce nothing. And then nine months, he would produce work after work after work after work that he became known for. And so I think it's actually natural for us to go through these cycles of up and down. Now, can we make the downs shorter? Can we make the ups longer? Can we engineer a way to push ourselves more? I hope so. But I've hit the point now where I'm just like, I think this is the way that it is for everyone, and this is how life is. And so I, used, I, I don't think I should waste any more time or effort or energy worrying about it. Just embrace it and, and get on with it. Do, do you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, I do. And uh, yeah, I really like that, guys. What do you think about that? Because I, I think. Ryan, whole... what do you think about that? <laughs> yeah. Well, <laughs> nice. <laughs> I I spend a lot of these podcasts kind of listening to guys more. I'm sorry, I've had to keep muting my mic and my camera because I'm suffering with hay fever. Um, I actually thought it was COVID again this afternoon, but um, I tested negative, so I think it's just hay fever. I feel terrible, but uh, I have been listening, and I often listen to these podcasts um, because these guys are a lot more life experienced than me. That's a nice way of saying that older. usually Lee, Lee, and, <laughs> Lee, and, Lee and Joe are a lot older than I am. They're, but, they're old dudes, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, you know, th there's often times I, I feel like I, there isn't an awful lot that, that I feel I can bring to the conversation that these guys already haven't. Um, obviously, it doesn't mean my opinion is invalid or anything along those lines, but uh, there's often a lot of the time where I feel these guys kind of have a, you know, a stronger and probably a more worthy opinion 
Um, oh, and that isn't self-deprecating. That isn't self-deprecating. That isn't self-deprecating. But it's more in the sense that these guys have done more. These guys have done more, you know, kind of with, with okay. their lives, and they are more life experienced. That, doesn't okay, mean, cool. that, that doesn't... was all the hedge. That was all the hedge. So, what do you think about it? <laughs> you know, I I think that I think the journey you've been on's been been incredible. You know, I, mean, I listened I listened to the interview as well um, uh, over the weekend from a couple of years ago, similarly to Lee, um, and and I think that that to be in your position is is amazing to have that choice. I think I think the the freedom of choice is is much more important than what people think. Um, a lot of people are, are pushed down a path, and you know they come out of school and they didn't do so well, so they 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 get a job that they don't particularly like, and they get stuck because opportunities aren't available to them, or they don't feel that opportunities are available to them, or they're not motivated to push those opportunities. But you know I think, and I'm sure you are, but but to have to have the you know the gratefulness to to accept that. You can go from where you were pre-pandemic to where you are now and still be happier than where you were then. Because a lot of people would have loved to have been in your position uh, even before the pandemic. And, and I'm sure it wasn't a terrible place to be, but obviously mentally struggled with that. Um, but I think knowing that, that you've come out the other side and you're, dare I say it, happier than perhaps where you were before, I think that's an absolute credit to kind of the hard work you've put in better yourself it doesn't matter where where you are in a job or in a family life or or situation or as long as you're happy that's you know, that, that, at the end of the day that's all that that really matters um so yeah you know that's that's kind of let, let me let me add let me add to this like i so appreciate what you're saying because i'm i'm so fortunate i i'm so fortunate because i spent we, we I started the agency in 2006 i didn't pull a lot of money out of the company like I, I paid myself a decent amount, but not a crazy amount. And so we built the balance sheet, right? Like the, the, the money, the, the earnings, the cash was sitting in the company. And then over the last few years, I've been able to just run off that, that cash, like just, just not really impact my life too much. Yeah, um, I, I, I earned maybe 50% of what I did then, but, but um, I've been able to just burn off the, ca the cash that the company had on hand. So one side of me, and I'm, I'm saying this almost to get your guys' thoughts on it, your perspective. One side of it, I could easily hear everybody who's listening to this who say, wow, that's great for him. You know, he's, he, he, he built this company. He has all this money, or he can take the time to do those things. Because on one hand, I, I hate to say this out loud even, I've, I've probably spent about half a million dollars slowing down enough to be able to take the time to figure this out. And when I say that I've spent that money, I basically mean like like operating at a loss year after year after year after year as opposed to earning profits. But by when I say burn everything to the ground, it's cost me about a half a million dollars. Wow. Now, on one side, I sound like a rich douche. On the other side, though, and the way that I look at it, is, is um, that is a sacrifice that I probably wouldn't have made if two years ago you said, hey, by the way, this is what it's <laughs> going to take. It's just kind of what it is. This is the part that makes me incredibly uncomfortable because on the other side of it is I've spent 12 or 13 years building that up as our safety net. You know, if something were to happen to me, we have some life insurance, but, but that money was supposed to take care of my wife and, and kids and family. And that money was supposed to pay for my kids' university educations. And that money was supposed to be the thing that fueled our retirement in 20 or 30 years. And now I've spent it all. So what I struggle with is either in a few years, we're going to look back and I'm going to be the biggest genius in the world because I was willing to, to risk this little thing and take this step the slowdown. I was willing to slow down and, and, re and lower my net worth to invest in who I could become. I'm either the greatest genius in the world or I'm completely crazy. I'm completely crazy because I will have taken my net worth and slowed down and gotten poorer along the way and risked my, my kid's university and, and what happens if something happens to me and all of these things and it didn't work out. 
And I just blew, again, scarcity mindset, right? I just blew my one, my one shot at having wealth. My retirement is gone. And I share that because no matter where you are on your journey, how old or how young, how much wealth you've built or not, if you're renting an apartment or, or if you're letting a place and you need to move in with roommates or get a smaller place, that is just as big of a sacrifice as me spending all of the money we had in the company to keep things going, right? Because it's all proportionate. But most people aren't willing to make that sacrifice. And again, if you go back two years, three years, I don't think I would have said like, hey, yeah, let's go ahead and do this. Um, so I'm proud of it, but we all can make those sacrifices at any point in our life to set ourselves up for who we need to become, create that space again for who you need to become. So five years or 10 years or 20 years from now, you look back and go, oh, I'm so, it was hard and it was scary, but I'm so glad I spent those four years, those eight years, whatever it takes to do this shift so you can live that bigger life, so you can generate more money or you can be happier or you can choose to travel the world and work remotely if that's what you prefer or have those kids or whatever it is that you want in life. Uh, it only will come by making that sacrifice. It's not just going to come to you. And so I don't know what you guys think. Like I, I've never shared that publicly before, uh, but but Am I, am I the rich guy who was super lucky because I was able to do it? Or am I just like everyone else who could make the sacrifice, whatever, whatever size sacrifice that really is? I think you touched on it when you said it's all proportionate because it is. There's lots of things to sacrifice depending on what those things are for people and what their ambitions are. I think for you, just where you said, what will you look back on and how will you feel about it? I, I think the most important thing is no matter what, is you won't remember how much money was in your bank account or what you were spending. You'll just remember how you feel at the time. And I know this because I spent a long time growing up and, you know, as growing up in the nineties um, here in the UK, it's all fueled by what you've got, get your house, get your car, money in the bank, blah, blah, all that stuff. And I grew from a background where I didn't have all of that and it was get out to work, get it. And I was really driven by getting to that next level no idea what it was it was just more than what i've got now um and driven 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 prior and i mean i've talked from previous podcasts ups, ups and downs 30s was horrendously in debt it all gone in the opposite direction completely um and probably about six years ago is when it went over the tipping points where it started to feel good and things were building etc but i if i look back to myself at 30 i don't remember what I was earning or how much money as a bank, what those things were. I remember what I was doing and who I was with and the places that I, I was. And I think that's from where you're saying there, although the money's very present right now, I think what you'll get from it is a value of clearly, I mean, this is a moment in time, but you now to two years ago, you seem a lot happier in yourself. And I think that's that's probably what you'll, you'll remember from it. And you said sank as well, which and this is me personal, I might not come across good for it, but you said a phrase that really grates on me, which is the, well, that's all right for him, where you said about that, oh, it's, because I, I don't, I think it's really dismissive when people say that, because it's not that it's all right for you. You weren't born with a marketing company and the resources you had and everything. You worked and you went through the trials and tribulations and you see on social media, the whole iceberg thing and, you know, the little bit at the top people see and all the crap below it that you had to go through to get there. And that's that's what got you to that little bit where someone will just dismiss it, dismiss it off and be like, oh, that's all right for some, but you didn't just luck into it or you didn't win lottery. <laughs> no one just gifted it to you. You, you worked for that, just like everyone yeah. works for whatever they've got. And then I think it's free to do whatever they want with whatever that thing is that they've got there. So you were in a fortunate position to do what you could do in your situation, but anyone could do the same thing with whatever they've got, big or small, like you said, if you're if you're if you own a house you could sell it not saying you have to I, I know people personally who've really inspired me who set up a business that turned out to be really successful but he only got it started by remortgaging his house that he paid for with the last business that he set up which was a you know a big gamble and sacrifice to make or like you said if you're renting somewhere could you move in with flatmates I know people that would do that similarly I know people that would never be prepared to do that and that's that's part of what kind of people set their tolerance for where their bar is, I suppose. 
And I think you've, you've gone all in on a certain direction. And you said earlier, and I want to reference this, that you know, you've given up one path of uncertainty for another path of uncertainty, but you sound a lot more optimistic about the path that you're on now than the one you were on before. So it, it really sounded like you were at crossroads before, where you've now decided on a path, and yes, it's uncertain, but you know where you're going or what that looks like or what you've got to do to get there. Which, I, again, I just think sounds like a really positive place to be. It, yeah, I mean, I, I, again, I feel, I feel so much better. A big thing that really changed my thinking, do, do you guys know this book? For our listeners, I'm holding up a book called Psycho-Cybernetics. Uh, it was written in the 1960s, and it was recommended to me from um, one of your countrymen. But basically, this plastic surgeon, do you guys know this book? No, no, I've not seen that one before. No? Oh. So it's, a, it's like, it's a really kind of, it's like the granddaddy of self-help books. Tony Robbins, most of what Tony Robbins spoke to in the 90s and the 2000s is literally just this repackaged. Oh, wow. And this book, Psycho-Cybernetics, um, again, written in the 1960s, so you have to take it with a grain of salt. But a, a plastic surgeon of all people wrote this because he noticed that when he would do corrective surgery for um, World War II or Korean War veterans who had disfigurements, um, uh, salespeople who were failing at sales because they thought their ears were too big, and then he'd correct their ears, and suddenly their sales would go through the roof. Like He noticed that people would come in with some of these times really minor issues and sometimes really major issues, and he would correct them, and suddenly their personalities would change overnight. But sometimes they wouldn't. Some, for some people, they wouldn't change at all. The person would come in because they thought their nose was too large. They had zero confidence. They had zero social skills. They felt terrible. He'd correct, he'd do a quote unquote correction for their nose, and then they would go on with their dour attitude, and they wouldn't change at all. And so he started trying to figure out why this might be. But part of what I've really loved about this book, and I've really started to embrace, is um, you can call it manifestation, I suppose. Today we might call it that. But, um, but, but basically, the, think of a ballistic missile. So a missile being launched from the ground or from the plane or from somewhere else where its job is to intercept another missile. So I'm not a scientist. I'm not a physics guy. But, but when these were created in the 40s or the 50s before computers and stuff, think about this. Like they engineered these missiles that are traveling however fast it's traveling to be at the exact right place to intercept another missile to blow it up. I don't even know how they calculate that stuff. But, but what happens is the, the missile is flying straight. And there's these little servos that will help it go up or down, left or right. And the, it's going through the wind, which is buffeting it, just like when you're on a plane and you hit turbulence. And it's trying to be at the perfect place at the perfect time so it can hit its target. But constantly throughout, it's jarring all over the place as it flies through the air. And that is us, right? If we have a goal, if we have a target, if we have a vision of what we want to be and we believe we can get there and we start taking steps towards getting there, all of this negative feedback that we get that I used to interpret as I'm not good enough, right? I, I'm not smart enough. I'm not good enough. I should have done it right. Blah, blah, blah. But think about the ballistic missile, right? Like it's getting negative feedback that it's off course and it's making these small adjustments as it goes. And it's doing that by, by, by doing, you know, if, if it goes too far to the left, the servos will change it and it'll go a little bit more to the right and get back on track so it can be exactly where it needs to be. S study after study for decades now, like almost 100 years, has proven that we as people, if we set a really concrete goal and we have a vision for what that is and we can imagine it and we believe it's possible, but we don't know how to do it, we don't know how it's going to work out. We don't know when it's going to work out, but we just, we just know that it will. Time after time after time, people hit that goal. And study after study in humans, in, in mice, in all, in, they, they study cockroaches. Like They've done all of these studies for, for, and I don't even know why this stuff is hidden, because, because people have been studying this for like 100 years now. Study after study has proven that if you have a goal, a specific goal, and you have a vision, and you believe that you can do it, 
like that missile that's constantly adjusting, the negative feedback that we're getting from the actions that we're taking to make these small corrections and these small changes to get there, it will happen for you. Oh, I love that. It will happen for you. And so I am incredibly nervous about the fact that, well, what if it doesn't? Like, what if it doesn't? <laughs> what if uh, all this stuff? But, but, but part of, um, you know, last year I had these five books and I put out a video on YouTube you can check out, but I put out the five books that changed my life in 2021 because I read these things and I just chose to believe that they're true. This book right now, Cyber Cy Psycho Cybernetics, I'm just choosing to believe that it's true because, I mean, science has even proven it. It sounds like woohoo. It sounds absolutely bananas to me. But, but so I'm now just choosing to believe that this vision I have for my company, for me, for we do hard things, that I can imagine it, that it's achievable, that other people have done it, that there's no real magic to this. There's no real secret to this. I just need to do it. And I don't know how it will work out. I don't know how long it'll take to work out. But I know that it will work out. Now, deep down inside, I'm still a little nervous. Like, well, what if it doesn't? But I just keep trying to override that with it will. It will work out. It will work out. It will work out. Keep going. Keep going. It will work out. Um, I'm nervous it won't. But every, every study shows that it will. So off I go for the next year or two, just believing it'll all work out in the end. That's so good, honestly. Uh, I think that's really inspiring. I mean, obviously, Inspiration Generation podcast, that's inspiring to me. And when you're talking, actually, that thing about I know it will work out, but you still feel nervous. When you're talking, I was feeling there's some things inside me about, you know, our podcast, is it going to go? I want it to work. You know, we want it to work. And I feel that as well. But the other thing I noticed, I remember you were saying around when you went, and I don't know why it came to my mind, but it's when you were talking about the Tony Robbins podcast, you're working with some fella, I can't remember the name's Gabe, but he said, Mark, the reason it's not working for you is because you don't have, you're not certain of what yeah. you want. Do you, do you remember that conversation? There's a guy, oh, yeah. you, were, you were there, and he said to you, Mark, the, the issue is, and this is almost going back to this book and what you're talking about, is having a really clear direction. Is that, so, 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 so that piece of advice, do you think that's driven anything? Where, where is that is that had an impact since that day or yeah yeah just for our, for our listeners who maybe don't know the story i was at tony robbins with my friend evan carmichael we're in a very special section not because of me but because evan <laughs> works true. with tony robbins team so i'm i'm in like the front row i got evan to my right i got this amazing actor to my left uh i'm with us olympic gold medalist snowboarders and just i had no business being there but the guy who, um, who I was working with in this, this exercise was the godfather to, I think, Tony Robbins' kids or something. Oh. And so he'd been there like 13 times, and he knew the stuff. And this guy was like doing some like just next – he was doing like billion-dollar deals and stuff. But I'm like mumbling my way, struggling my way through these exercises. And he goes, Mark, you don't know what you want. You don't know what you want. That's it. I'm like, no, 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 I, but you know what? I'm just unsure. And he's like, you don't know what you want. And, and that, that's, that hit me. And you're right. Um, I've, I've realized, and part of, part of working through this book over the last month even is, is I want to get better at goal setting. Uh, and, and when I was saying earlier, for Spartan, for example, I'm 10 pounds heavier than I really should be if I really wanted to be competitive. And maybe I can use recognition to tap into stuff to get me to perform the way I need to perform. And that's all because I set these goals that, that I don't always follow. I mean, I, I, I don't follow through with or I don't take seriously enough or I don't believe in or I believe in them for a week or two and then I stop believing in them. All these things that we all do, I just don't want to do them. But... Um, I, I don't know what to do next other than I've come to terms with the fact that right now, right now, I'm not great at goal setting. Uh, I'm not great at prioritizing and I'm not great at time management. So, so either I need to get better at these things because they're holding me back or I embrace the fact that I'm not great at these as visionaries and maybe I don't need to be and maybe I can surround myself with people who actually are gifted at that and maybe we can build up a stronger team to fill in the gaps that I have. I, don't, I, I haven't yet figured out if this is for me to fix or for me this, to find people who could just do this for me, but setting those goals, uh, 
prioritizing out of the million things that run through my head and then time management are three things right now that are holding me back. Wow. The honesty is right there, guys. What are your thoughts around that? It's great, great self-awareness. We talk with this, there's a lot of that going on with it. But I think, like you said, it's in embracing those things that you're doing and knowing, like you said, do you work on them or do you find someone who can work on it for you? Or do you work around it? I've referenced in this loads of times. I have an awful short-term memory, but I have a really good system for setting myself reminders to counter my awful short-term memory. I think Mark had it. I, 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 I love that. Now, for anyone listening, like, oh, it's so self-aware. I, I mean, I've been thinking about this stuff for a long time, but, but Jose, the, the story you referenced was November, I think, 8th or 9th, 2018. It's 2022 now. Wow. So it's like, you know, it's like I can, I can rhyme these things off because it's like, yeah, because yeah, I'm thinking about them month after month. Four years ago, someone told me that I sucked, that I didn't know what I wanted. I can now articulate the challenge. So, yes, I think self-awareness is the first step. Being aware of it means that you can change it, uh, especially if it's something that you want to get better at. But, but this, like, this might take me another two or three years to even figure out. Like, I, I don't, I don't even know. I might, like, I might look back and say, I can't believe it took me a decade to figure that one out. Why didn't I, you know, whatever? I, I don't know. But these things don't happen quickly. So, for anyone who feels behind or the pressure of time or or I, I have to figure this out these things take a lot of time and when you consider that you know i'm turning 40 next year if i can figure this out in my 30s and set myself up for more powerful 40s if you're in your 40s and you can set yourself up for more powerful 50s 50s and 60s whatever it is if i'm god willing able to live to like let's say 85 boy that'd be amazing I still have 45 years ahead of me. So if I take some time now to lose the money or spend the money to figure these things out, to slow down, whatever it is, and it takes three, four, five, six, seven years, is, isn't that worth it? So that way the next 45 years, I'm living the type of life I want to live. And no matter where you are in life, isn't it, isn't it worth it? And that's the thing that I've come to remind myself of because – all of this stuff just feels way too slow, honestly. <laughs> I think that's great advice. And it's, it's all part of what is a theme here, where it's just you are taking a lot of that self-created weight off your shoulders and it's letting you actually grow quicker, even though you've taken off the pace of trying to grow too quickly, which is really, really good. Really, as, as Joe said, really inspiring, which is, is what we're here for. And I think it's your, more than anything else, your openness about all of this and insecurities and fears and everything i think it's just it's really inspiring to hear which i hope is what you know the listeners and viewers and everything are getting out of this as well i just want go on you're going to say no go on I was, I was going to do my shilling i was going to take the opportunity as you know we're drawing in a new audience from mark being on here you'll notice i've merged myself up i'm wearing a hoodie there's one in the background i've been drinking from a mug inspirationnation.org.uk everything is there Joe's wearing his. Ryan, we got anything for the camera? Mark looking around. It's under his bed. It's gone. It's probably under the duvet now that you've made Why the bed. Why do you tidy it up for Mark? Hey, look, you're going to mug me off, but I'm the one that's consistently <laughs> got the mug. You have. You, uh, you, to be honest, you do, yeah. So Ryan needs a new mug. Not somewhere. He's going to head over to inspirationnation.org.uk and he's going to order it. Look at that. <laughs> Mark's, even, Mark's even got a mug on the shot, Ryan. Mine says YouTube on it, though. <laughs> Close enough. We're on YouTube. It's fine. Just look for Jose Neuer. Stick him in YouTube. Find all that lovely, great content over there. And Mark, as well, you're on YouTube. You were in the throes of starting a podcast last time we spoke, or last time Joe spoke to you. You're now two years on that. Where do people find you? What are you up to? Yeah, uh, so We Do Hard Things is actually a YouTube show first, and then we release everything second for audio. But we spend an incredible amount of time and, and effort connecting with some of the most remarkable people in the world. These are people from business, so entrepreneurs. These are creatives. These are people from uh, the world of sports. And it's all about, I mean, our mission is to give people hope that pursuing your passions at all costs will lead to an extraordinary and happy life. And so uh, all of these things that I've been speaking about in terms of, you know, I consider them all hard things more so than saying, I'm going to run a marathon. Yeah, that's hard. 
but that's like a physical hard. But all these other hard things, choosing to be your creative self and put your work out there. Um, stepping back from a business, I spoke with Rand Fishkin, the, uh, the CEO and founder of a company called Moz that he grew to $35 million and did a terrible job <laughs> of, of selling it and, and had to eventually leave the company after a bout of depression and start his next company and burn all his bridges and lose all his friends. That's hard. But uh, if you head over to YouTube, we do hard things, or you can look up Mark Drager. You can find me over there and watch the shows. Uh, I, th I think they're pretty kick-ass. Oh, uh, I can uh, testament to that. There's uh, some pretty cool people on that. I mean, honestly, the people you've interviewed, Mark, amazing. Les Brown. Oh, my God. So good. <laughs> that one was fun. <laughs> yeah. Les Brown. Right. Well, awesome. So, so many good people. Honestly, you definitely do want to go check it out. Very inspiring. And a lot of the less, lot, so many good lessons, honestly, to learn from that. So, yeah, definitely worth going over and checking it out. It's so good. So good. Excellent stuff. Uh, appreciate it out there, Mark. I've got a couple of things I was going to mention to wrap us up on. Before I do, Ryan, anything from you while we have Mark here that you wanted to ask or comment on? Um, it's going to sound like a poor answer, but but no, I think I think we've spoken about kind of the journey and kind of the the where Mark was to where Mark is, and I think he's given a great account of himself and um, answered any questions that I would have before we'd even started. I think. I appreciate you being here as well because I can hear how much you're struggling as you're bunged up there. I don't so know what's going on with run. me. I don't know what's going on with me. I feel terrible. You're like, please don't ask me anything. I don't want to have to talk. <laughs> I Jose, promise, from I, I you, promise I'm listening. I promise. <laughs> I, I wanted to ask Mark one last question. The question he asks all his guests. So, Mark, what's it all come down to? Ah, that's the question. At the end of the day, what does it all come down to? Yeah. Um. No one's ever asked me that question, which is which is so interesting because I ask that of, of almost everyone that I speak to. Um, I, th I think for me, it's um, being comfortable in your own skin and realizing that you're pretty awesome and extraordinary. Like the realest version of you the people in your life may not like that right now because they're so used to that fake version of you, the one that you put up. But the true, real, inside version of you that, that rarely comes out, that only people see maybe if you've had a bit too much to drink or you're on vacation or what have you, like that real version of you, if you can spend all your time being that person and being comfortable in your skin and not second guessing things. <sighs> Doesn't that sound like not only the most amazing life, but what a gift that you can give to others because your work will be that much better and more meaningful. And the way you show up for the people in your life will be that much more giving and grace filled and amazing. And so it's just like, I don't know if I'm articulating this well but just spending each minute of every day being the person that you're called to be to me sounds like the most amazing way to live wow i love that <laughs> absolutely honestly i i feel really inspired in it because yeah i just i love that well that's a, that's, a, that's a great answer thank you so much Honestly, yeah, I don't know what to say. Sorry, guys, I'll let it to you because I think I just... Uh, agree I love 100%. That. I and love that. Instead of ending on that high note, I'm still going to ask my much more lower level question <laughs> of, <laughs> did you ever get that garden finished? <laughs> in, in here in Canada, we call it a backyard. But, okay, uh, did you? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so <laughs> for, those, for those who may not know, I've spent far too many years working on my backyard i think we're going on year six now and um this year it will be completed so in june i'm going to build uh, our little waterfall feature a little waterfall wall that pours water into the pool uh and we're putting in a big order for all of our all of our trees and all of our shrubbery and all of that stuff uh and so we're close <laughs> we're close 
It's good. It was great. In the protein, it was a brilliant example for necessity. And you talked about the equipment and it going away. And I just thought it illustrated perfectly that thing that once you've got a deadline, you work to it. And it, it made me feel better about my three years in work in progress that I've probably spent accumulatively a week on it. But I like to say it's a three year work in progress at the moment. <laughs> well, here's the thing. So I have um, I have a 74 BMC mini, like one of the original minis, which um, I know in the UK was not a well, maybe, I mean, over the last 10 years, they've become incredibly rare. Um, but I know when I used to travel to the UK in the, in the knots, um, they were just everywhere. And so I, I bought this car as a shell in my final year of high school, which was 21 years ago. It's still sitting in my garage, unfinished, after 21 years. Uh, never driven it. I've spent ridiculous amounts of money to, to import all the parts and to do everything I need to do. And, um, and I'm still not done it yet. I haven't worked on it probably in three or four years, but I used to go through these spurts of like, I'll work on it for a few months and then take nine months off and then work on it. And, uh, and it just sits there as this like weird, like I, I haven't found someone who I can pay to finish it. Um, I'm not focused on it. I'm not spending any time on it. I even thought last year of maybe selling it, but no one would give me enough money to even recoup how much money I've spent on it. <laughs> and uh, so it's this weird thing from a previous life, previous version of my life that I don't know how to feel about it. But, but you know, if you are the type of person who likes to take on new things or take on projects or try things or what have you, they're not all gonna, they're not all gonna be completed and they're not all gonna be winners. Um, that's just life. Like, cool, you spent three years doing something, Okay, cool. What's, you know, that, there was a previous version of you that wanted that thing completed. And if you, same thing with my backyard, like six years ago, Mark wanted this amazing place. Like today, I'm, I'm cool with like, if we had to sell the house, I'd sell the house. Like it has like zero emotional <laughs> meaning to me at this point. That's, but, yeah, that's because of the thing you've now set though, right? This is because of this new, because now the priorities have changed, right? Yeah. And, uh, and Evan used to lean on me a lot about that, which is like, you know, I wanted to create a, a, a backyard or a garden or environment for entertaining and for having people over and for having fun times. And, and, I, and it was a reflection of like the type of life I wanted to build and the house I wanted to have and all that stuff. And um, now, I mean, mainly due to COVID or what have you, but, but entertaining is not that important to me anymore. Um, and yeah, my wife and I, like when we bought this place seven years ago, this was like our forever home. And then we realized that felt very limiting to think, is, is this it for forever? Like it was comfortable to know I would never move, but at the same time, it's like it removed all the possibilities of what could be. Same with the business. Yeah. And now I'm in the, the mode of like, who knows where our future will take us? Who knows, honestly? Um, and so, yeah, anyway, I share all that stuff just to say, if, if you got projects that aren't quite done, the best thing you can do is just dump them because you're not gonna, like, the best thing I could do is just dump the mini. You know, anyone listening who wants to buy a 74 left-hand drive mini that, that has a 1275 uh, motor in it and performance <laughs> parts and all of this stuff, let me know. <laughs> a, lot of UK, a lot of UK listeners, so you never know. You might get a reach out. So markdrager.com. All right, everyone. <laughs> Fantastic perspective. Love that. Thank you, Mark, for your time. So I really appreciate this. Obviously, second one of these. It's great. Two years' time from now, we'll check in again, see where you are on that journey. That's see if awesome. that mini's I been finished. <laughs> could be the could be the yeah the two every two year check in, couldn't it? Could be great. Absolutely. Yeah. But thank you very much. And of course, everyone yeah. out there listening, we appreciate you all. Check us out on social media at listen to I N, listen T O I N. For Joe, just stick Jose Noy Inspiration Nation into Google. If it's a social platform, he is on it. You will find him there. And Mark, where can people check you out as well? Head over to YouTube, look up We Do Hard Things or Mark Drager YT. Or you can head over to Instagram. My handle is at Mark Drager, and uh, I answer all my own DMs over there and all of that stuff. So if you send me a note, it will come straight to me. He Fantastic. does. Ask, you actually message him, so he does answer you. So there you go. <laughs> I'll send you a voice note. If you are listening and you send me a note on Instagram and you reference this podcast episode, I will send you a direct voice note. <laughs> wow. Excellent stuff. There is a pledge for you there. Right. All that's left for me to do then, guys, I'll count us down. Three, two, one. Inspiration Nation. We'll catch you catch guys, you guys later. later. So I want to know now, what's your biggest takeaway? Don't forget to hashtag it with Inspiration Nation in the comments below and make sure you commit to action. Thank you for checking out. So don't forget to catch all our other 
Inspiration Nation podcast episodes right over here. So go and check them out. And also, don't forget to subscribe because that will tell you when your next video goes live by you hitting that amazing bell. So until next time, it's Inspiration Nation, and I'll see you right over there. I'm never going to get this uploaded. <laughs> you guys will see that there's a little notification you'll have to clear off your screen, but other than that, we're rolling. <laughs> We're, we're, we're live on TikTok too. Come on. Right. Grandpa Noya, are we getting TikTok up and running? TikTok is on. We're on. I'm we're on. Running. See, I'm on with the technology. game. <laughs> Where are you? I can't yeah, see right, right here. Right here. I believe you. I believe you. Mine's just being slow. Right. Let's do this. Thank you, Mark. That was awesome, actually. So, that TikTok. We love you. We'll catch you later too. Thanks for listening.